Further questions relate to issues of religious ethical and secular ethical attitudes. From this, in turn, the question can be derived as, the, as to whether theological subjects can keep up with current ethical challenges and what sustainable readings religions can offer. Since the European Enlightenment and the, race, the rise of the natural sciences in the modern era, religious interpretations of the world have increasingly been problematized, not only in Islam, but also in other religions. The tension between evolution and creation is often cited as one of the examples within the Abrahamic religions. But are religions and science really incomp incompatible? How do religions react to the challenging developments of modern science? And what answers do they hold for people today? What might a sustainable theology look like that does justice to the complexity of our world? So this and more information, you can also see uh, at the homepage of the lecture series, which I will put into the post and uh, into the chat a little bit later. The first of four lectures in this online series will be given by Professor Dr. Dennis Alexander. The title of his lecture today is Science, Faith, and Ethics, as you can see already in our Zoom. Um, before I hand over to Dr. Alexander, I would like to introduce him briefly and apologize in advance already for the fact that the introduction of his person must remain incomplete due to his extensive professional career. Dr. Alexander is Emeritus Director of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion, and he is Emeritus Fellow of St. Edmund College in Cambridge. He was previously Chairman of the Molecular Immunology Program and Head of the Laboratory of Lymphocyte, Lymphocyte Signaling and Development at the Babraham Institute, also in Cambridge. Prior to that, he was at the Imperial Cancer Research Laboratories in London. It's now the Cancer Research Day of UK. And he spent 15 years developing university departments and laboratories overseas, latterly as an associate professor of biochemistry in the medical faculty of the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. There he helped to establish the National Unit of Human Genetics. He was initially an open scholar at Oxford reading biochemistry before obtaining a PhD in neurochemistry at the Institute of Psychiatry in London. Dr. Alexander writes lectures and broadcasts widely in the field of science and religion. From 1992 until 2013, he was editor of the journal Science and Christian Belief and previously served as a member of the Executive Committee of the International Society for Science and Religion. He published an amazing number of books in the mentioned fields, amongst others, some of the latest publications like Genes, Determinism, and God in 2017, Is There Purpose in Biology, 2018, and one of 2020's Are We Slaves to Our Genes? The list of his publication I will also post into the chat so the one who are interested can see which amount he uh, published. Before we start, one more thing. I want to tell you that the lecture of Professor Alexander will last about 40 minutes. Afterwards, the audience gets 20 minutes for questions. I kindly ask the audience for formulate questions and send it directly to me in the chat. You might also raise your hand in the Q&A and I will directly give you the word. Please, before you ask the question or send the question in the chat, please tell also to which institute, department, or workplace you're affiliated with. This was a little introduction from my side. I now give the word to Professor Dr. Alexander. Please, the floor is yours. We are very interested to hear your talk. Well, thank you very much indeed for your welcome, and I greatly appreciate being here online. And if there's any problem with the sound, then please tell me immediately at the beginning. If the sound is good, then that's fine. Okay, it's always good to check that, I think, in these uh, Zoom meetings. So uh, as a person of faith, I've spent the past 40 years of my life in the scientific research community. And so I do believe that relating science and faith and ethics 
as we've just been hearing, is, uh, is a really important topic. An important topic for scientists, important topic for the general public, an important topic for those studying theology, because we all need to be involved in this very really, uh, important enterprise. So let me just start by giving you uh, a roadmap, if you like, of where we're going um, with this lecture for the next few minutes. I thought, I thought we should spend just a few minutes uh, talking about how we understand the word science. That might seem obvious, uh, but as we'll see, the word does have rather different nuances, different flavors, different meanings in different cultures. And I think we need to spend a little bit of time on that. And then secondly, I want to introduce the four ethical tools in what I'm going to call our ethical toolbox for very traditional ways in Western philosophy and thought of understanding ethics and how we apply ethical principles. But then I want to take a practical example in our third part of the talk to see how these ethical tools actually can be applied to a specific very recent major advance in science. And I think as we look at that, we'll see how worldviews also are very uh, influential in the way that we use the toolbox and the way we use these ethical tools in practice. So let's just start then by thinking a very basic question really about what is science? Because as I say, these understandings can be influenced by languages, by culture, by background, and so forth. And in my own university, Cambridge, during its earlier centuries, as in all other European universities of that period, theology was famously referred to as the queen of the sciences. And the classics, theology, philosophy, what we now call science, were integrated in, together into the Latin scientia, one great body of learning and those engaged in scienta, scientia were known as natural philosophers. And it wasn't really until the 19th century that the various scientific disciplines began to emerge with separate specialized labels like physics and chemistry, biology and so forth. And it was in 1834 that the master of Trinity College here in Cambridge, the Reverend William Huell, invented the word scientist in English. And most scientists using the English language today don't realize that the name of their profession was invented by a 19th century Anglican priest. It wasn't really until the final decades of the 19th century that natural philosophers started calling themselves scientists. And as the historian Peter Harrison points out, in 1800, the term natural philosophy was still dominant in English books, but by 1900, it had been almost completely replaced by the term natural sciences. Science became more professionalized as it began to generate increasingly specialized bodies of constructed knowledge, a process which of course continues right up to the present day. So now science in English is generally taken to refer to the natural sciences, and if you come to Cambridge and ask the way to a science department, well, that's where you'll be directed in the direction of biology or physics or chemistry. But of course, you know better than I that in German, the word Wissenschaft has a much broader meaning than science in English, referring to any body of constructed academic knowledge, be it in the sciences or indeed in the humanities. And this is indeed the case when we look at uh, la science, in French or Chantia in Spanish or Alim in Arabic or Bilim in Turkish and so forth, as these words all refer, they all refer more generally to any scholarly body of academic knowledge. In fact, it turns out that all the words for science used in all the languages of the world, as far as I've been able to find out so far, really mean scientia or something closer to Wissenschaft. And it's only really in English that we're referring almost automatically to the natural sciences when we use the word science, or at least when we use the word science, it's the natural sciences that come first of all to our minds. So if we had to define science with this more English meaning of the natural sciences or modern science, then I wonder how we might do that. It's actually quite difficult. 
but let's have a go at a definition. And I quote, science is an organized endeavor to explain the properties of the physical world by means of empirically testable theories, experimentally testable theories constructed by a research community trained in specialized techniques, close quote. Maybe that's not a perfect definition, but it's the definition I'm going to be using in the discussion that follows, really referring then to the natural sciences. Now, if we can accept a definition like that just for the moment, then we can immediately see that science, meaning the natural sciences, are really rather limited in the kinds of questions they can address. Because scientific questions are limited to describing and understanding the properties of the physical world around us. So I want us to imagine just for a moment that the book of this complex entity that we call life is like a cube sliced into many layers as we see here. And I mean by life, I'm referring to the total sum of all that we experience. I like to call this the complementarity model as a way of understanding the different types of human knowledge for reasons you'll see in a moment. And so each layer in the cube as shown here represents one type of explanation, one form of human knowledge as we investigate the world around us. And so we need all the various levels of explanation to do justice to this complex, complex reality we call life. In reality, it's one book, but our brains are simply not up to the very difficult task of grasping the book in its entirety all at one go. So there we have a scientific level of explanation. I've put it at the top, you have to put it somewhere. I put it at the top, not because it's more important, but we have to put it somewhere and there we are. So what are we doing therefore? At the scientific level of understanding, we're seeking to understand the general properties of the physical world of all around us in the universe. We're trying to generate laws to describe the properties of the universe and so forth. It's more the physical aspect of life. But then of course, we have the ethical level, the level that we're going to be thinking about more today, the level which is addressing the question of ought. For example, science cannot tell us what we ought to do. It can analyze perhaps the reasons for a famine in some faraway country, but it cannot say whether we personally ought to donate money to help with famine relief in that country. And then we have the aesthetic level of understanding where we're thinking about the beauty of the world, the beauty in art, the beauty in poetry, the beauty in theater and so forth. And then we have the personal level of knowledge, the level of knowledge which is most important to us where we use the word I, my experience of the world. We certainly cannot publish that in scientific journals unless we're very famous perhaps, but it's the most important knowledge for us. And then of course, at the religious and philosophical level, we're asking questions like, well, why is there a universe anyway? Does life have any, any purpose in an ultimate sense? Does God exist? The point of course of this type of very simple model is to say that these levels of understanding explanation, these levels of human knowledge, they're not in any sense rivals to each other. They can be, they might be, but not necessarily. And we need them, as I say, we need them all to do justice to our own experience as human agents. I think we also need to put some yellow arrows going up and down to connect all those different levels, because of course, they are all about the same reality, the same reality of the world that we experience day by day, and they're all connected together in interesting ways. And indeed, that's why we have the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion here in Cambridge, because we're looking at those yellow arrows. We're trying to see how these different disciplines interrelate and connect up with each other. In fact, when you think about it, this model illustrates the way in which our universities are organized. Each department, each discipline has its own particular way of justifying its beliefs. If you're a scientist, then how your latest paper is assessed by a science journal depends on the particular norms and traditions that characterize that discipline. And what counts as evidence varies between disciplines, ethics, aesthetics, economics, history, law, theology, politics, philosophy, 
the humanities, the humanities in general, they're, they're simply beyond science. They, they don't really contradict science. They simply are forms of human knowledge that lie beyond science. They provide incredibly valuable knowledge, which is complementary, therefore, not rival to scientific knowledge. And so my point here is that we need many approaches and there are many ways of knowing as we investigate this complex world in which we live. So now let's move on to really the main topic of this lecture, which is ethics. How can we define ethics as a form of knowledge which is different from science? Well, we may define ethics as the philosophical study of the moral values of human conduct and of the rules and values that ought to govern them. And we immediately notice that very powerful little word, ought. It was the Scottish philosopher David Hume in particular, who drew attention to the fact that we cannot derive what we ought to do from what is the case. Even though we evolved to be meat eaters, and we do indeed have the right kind of metabolism for digesting meat, that does not mean that everyone ought to eat meat. Some people choose to be vegetarians. And so normative questions are questions about what ought to be the case, and along with that comes a fact value distinction. It's one thing to describe a certain behavior, behavior X. It's quite another thing to evaluate behavior X and see whether it is ethically right or wrong. Now, there are four main ethical approaches that are commonly used in ethical reflection in the Western tradition. And indeed, these are used by scientists in the ethics committees all the way around the world. One great thing about science is that it's a point of unity between many different peoples and cultures as they exercise the same sets of methods, exploring the same kinds of questions all over the world. And indeed, they would share, I think, these four tools in the ethics committees. As I say, we can think of these like an ethical toolbox, but the way we use the tools will depend very much on our worldview and indeed on our theology. My brief summaries here of these ethical approaches are intended to be descriptive, and at this stage we're not going to assess them, just make a few comments as we go along. So let's think about the tools in our toolbox. We start with natural law ethics. And the roots of this approach in the Western tradition are to be found in the Greek philosopher Aristotle, but it was really Thomas Aquinas, the 13th century theologian and philosopher, greatly influenced by Aristotle, who set out the parameters for what we now call natural law ethics. And for Aquinas, there are two key features of natural law. The first is that natural law is but one aspect of divine providence. And the second is that when we focus on the human's role as recipient of the natural law, it becomes a theory of practical rationality. Today, the general message that comes across from natural law theory is that the virtuous life is one lived according to nature, fulfilling our natural potential, in which we respond to ethical questions by asking the question, is it natural? So if we feel a natural revulsion in responding to some new proposed technology, then this reflects a natural law ethics, what we sometimes call in English, the yuck factor, something that we instinctively, we really don't like. And so we have an instinctive reaction against it. Secondly, we have utilitarianism, which is closely related to consequentialist ethics. And this is associated with the English philosopher Jeremy Bentham, who was very influential in the early 19th century. And the idea here is that ethical decisions should be judged by their practical utility. Who will benefit? Who will not benefit? Are the costs worth it? And as I say, for that reason, the philosophy is therefore closely connected to consequentialism. What are the likely consequences of this ethical decision? Will it be good or bad consequences? And the problem here, of course, is in knowing ahead of time what the consequences are likely to be. And people may disagree about what good and bad may be in this context. Third, we have deontological ethics. The term is derived from the Greek deon, meaning obligation or duty. This means doing the right thing, whatever the consequences. And it's sometimes called rule-based ethics, 
because the main aim is to adhere to a set of rules. It is ethically right to stop at red traffic lights. The rules issued by university or research institutes, Essex boards are deontological in nature in the sense that everyone in the academic community is expected to stick to those rules. And of course, so we should. You will not commit fraud in reporting your scientific results. You will not exclude someone's name from a paper submitted for publication when they have made a significant contribution to the results. That's all very good and important. But it does raise the question as to how the deontological rules are established in the first place. And do, de and do deontological rules get us to the heart of ethics? For example, if we can get away with it by not following one of the research rules and no one is hurt, then is that really okay? Question. And deontological ethics is closely related to divine command theory, which of course refers to the claim that morality is ultimately based on the commands or character of God, and that the morally right action is the one God commands or requires. Well, this clearly leads to deontological ethics because the main aim is to adhere to a set of rules that have been established by God. Then fourthly, we have virtue ethics. And the key question here is, what kind of person should I be? What actions will encourage virtuous qualities in myself and in others? If I keep not stopping at red traffic lights, will that not lead to a generally bad attitude in myself and in others towards the virtue of obedience to the law? The problem here is that one always has to know or define what a virtuous behavior or character is before you can get going with virtue ethics. When it comes to the complexities of some bioethical issues, then knowing what is the most virtuous behavior is not always easy, as we shall see in a moment. So those are the four main tools in our ethics toolkit. Now, clearly, how people use physical tools depends on how experienced they are in using those tools. And equally clearly, when it comes to our ethical toolkit, their use will depend very much on the worldview of the person using the tools. For example, if you have a worldview centered on a materialistic philosophy, then you may use the toolkit differently from someone with a theistic theological worldview. And so to see how this works out in practice, I now want to take an example of a recent advance in science that raises difficult ethical questions. And then we're going to discuss how we might use our ethical toolkit in this particular practical example. As we do that, I think we will see that the worldview of the person using the ethical toolkit will very much affect how the tools are used. Well, my example here is known as human embryo editing. And I will first explain the science briefly and what it involves. And this is indeed a very early human embryo that you're looking at here in the picture. So embryo editing has arisen from a big technical advance which has swept through the biomedical research field during the past few years. And this is known as CRISPR-Cas genetic engineering technology. And CRISPR-Cas, just to explain it very briefly and simply, is a piece of molecular machinery that was originally isolated from bacteria where it provides them with an immune system that was originally isolated, which originally has designed to protect them against invasion by viruses. And the system uses a so-called single guide RNA molecule, you can see it on the top left of your screen, that guides the Cas molecule to the price, to precise spot in the DNA where you want to target a particular gene. And this Cas bit of this system, I, I, I'm sorry if you don't have much science in your background, it'll be difficult to follow maybe, but hopefully I can give you the general idea. That Cas bit of the system is an enzyme called a nuclease that cuts the DNA. So it's like, if you like, guiding a pair of scissors 
to precisely the right spot in the DNA in order to change its sequence. And the same system can also be used to repair mutations in a given gene that may be causing disease. A mutation simply refers to a change in the normal sequence of the genetic letters in the DNA. And this CRISPR-Cas technique and some closely related techniques have swept across the biological research world over the past decade or so. Because you can use it, you can use CRISPR-Cas with increasing precision and efficiency as the technique is improved to change the DNA in pretty much any organism you like, in plants, animals, or indeed in humans. And I just looked up the scientific literature yesterday and discovered that there are 2,129 papers in the scientific literature out so far this year where they have the word CRISPR in the title. So thousands of scientific papers are coming out using this really amazing technology. And the use of CRISPR-Cas for human embryo editing became particularly famous in November 2018, when this doctor here, Dr. He Jiankui from Shenzhen in China, made the dramatic claim that for the first time ever, genetic engineering had been used to change the human germline. The germline refers to the genetic information that is passed on from the parent to the child. And Dr. He reported the birth of twins, one of whom at least lacked the gene encoding a molecule called CCR5. And this is a protein which is necessary in many cases for HIV infection to occur. And so Dr. He had carried out embryo editing in order to remove that particular gene from the twins. And at least one of them, uh, at least possibly both of them, it's not clear, actually lacks that particular gene, and so lacks that particular molecule, CCR5. Now, there was a huge amount of international criticism uh, in response to Dr. Her's uh, announcement. For example, this broke international ethical rules, and indeed, there are less risky ways of preventing HIV infection in children, because Dr. Her was trying to prevent, the aim was to try and prevent these particular twins from being infected by HIV from their parents. There's also the problem that CCR5 may be required for other functions as yet unknown. It probably is actually, and experimenting with children is simply wrong. And in any case, why not aim at healing a lethal genetic mutation that causes death rather than aiming at enhancement. In this case, this is an example of enhancement, something they're trying to give extra to those twins, uh, defense against protection against HIV that they didn't have before. And the problem was, of course, that the experiments on humans of Dr. Zhang Kui had not been passed by an ethics committee properly at his university, and he was therefore sentenced to prison in 2019, and he was just released I think a couple of months ago during the summer. Right, so that's a little background and indeed many other attempts are being made to edit early embryos in this way using CRISPR and other related techniques. There are actually about 7,000 human genetic diseases that are caused by defects in a single gene. And clearly the goal of these further experiments, unlike the ones carried out by He Xiangqui, which involved the healing of no genetic disease, the main goal of the other experiments is to implant the healed embryo in the mother with the aim of giving birth to a child healed of a particular genetic disease running in a family. We're not there yet, it hasn't been done yet, but that's the ultimate goal. And indeed, there are hundreds of genetic mutations that can cause the death of children in their very early years. But as the reaction to the Zhang Kui work has highlighted, further research to ensure safety is necessary before the legal embargo on such germline editing may perhaps eventually be lifted. At present, embryo editing is not allowed in any country, and this at least allows time for further ethical reflection and work on the safety concerns. So, 
that's the background. Now, our main question here is, how do we apply our ethical toolkit to the ethical issues raised by embryo editing? And that's simply uh, keep to the aim of embryo editing to try and heal genetic mutations, which might otherwise lead to the early death in childhood of children. Let's just see then what the four ethical positions would say about this. Well, natural law ethics might say that when the technique is used to cure the mutations that lead to lethal genetic diseases, then this involves healing. It involves returning the defective gene in the embryo to its normal natural state. And so because of that, it's acceptable. Perhaps a natural law ethics position could take that position. Utilitarianism would surely say that the outcome of the procedure is good, providing health and safety concerns are addressed, so such a procedure is justified. But utilitarianism might also point to the dangers that the technique could be used for bad purposes, the so-called slippery slope concern. And that's why indeed we put our skier there falling over because it's difficult to know what might lie ahead. For example, once the CRISPR-Cas technology is perfected, then what might be the wrong kind of applications that this technology might be used for? What about those in future who might want to enhance humans by introducing modifying genes into the human, germ gene, into the human germline? Now, utilitarians might also point out that in 99 out of uh, 100 cases, there's no point in genetically healing early embryos because there's a much simpler method available and it's already in use and it's been in use for many years now. And that is to screen early embryos by the method of pre-implantation diagnosis. And here what you do is you screen embryos in IVF clinics, so they only eight cells big, eight to 10 cells big, you can remove a cell. Um, quite safely during this process of IVF or in vitro fertilization. And you can check and see whether that genetic mutation that you want to avoid is present in that embryo. And obviously if you find the mutation is present, then you don't implant that embryo. And so you select the embryos, you maybe have five, six, seven embryos if you're lucky, and you select the healthy embryos that don't carry a lethal disease and you implant those embryos in the mother. Now, in certain very rare cases, all the embryos will carry the mutation because both parents are carriers of a dominant gene. This means that only one copy of the defective gene is enough to cause the disease. An example of this is Huntington's disease although it'd be very rare indeed to have a situation in which both parents were carriers of the Huntington's disease gene. But in that rare case, might CRISPR technology be used to heal the embryos in the laboratory before implantation? Well, that's a question. Now, deontological ethics might be more concerned about the status of the early human embryo. In any group of people, there are generally three types of belief about the status of the early human embryo. I'm going to call them belief A, B, and C. Belief A is that the zygote, that is the fertilized egg, is a human person and has all the rights of personhood. Therefore, in this view, in vitro fertilization is wrong in principle because it involves the wastage of embryos. In that case, attempts to cure mutant human embryos is wrong because it involves such a wastage. So this is a classic deontological position. Something is wrong in principle, and so we should not do it, and under, under any circumstances. Belief B is the view that the zygote is a potential person and therefore deserves our protection, but not at any cost. In this view, Destroying an early embryo is not the same as killing a person, but should be avoided as much as possible. And so in this view, healing early embryos might be justified if there were very good reasons to do so. People with this belief would be happy with in vitro fertilization 
because it allows infertile parents to have their own child, even though this involves embryo wastage. And then belief C maintains that the early human embryo is of no value at all because it's just a small collection of cells and so wastage is of no significance. Now, what about virtue ethics in this particular context of human embryo editing? This position might suggest that the goal to achieve perfect health is an illusion and that trying to eliminate a human disease from the population somehow lessens, diminish, diminishes the value of all the other people who suffer from that disease. Virtue ethics might also point out that showing love within a family does not necessarily entail having genetically related children. For example, a better option to avoid passing on genetic disease might be adoption or the use of donor sperm for in vitro fertilization, known, as I say, as IVF. And virtue ethics is of particular relevance when thinking about genetic enhancement. And enhancement is really very different from healing. Transhumanists would like to create people with enhanced intelligence, athletic abilities, super health, and so forth. But all we know now about the complexity of the genome, about all of that DNA information that we have in our genes and our DNA, all of that suggests that transhumanists are actually deceived in their hopes. Take intelligence, for example. The contribution of any one genetic variant to the variation in intelligence in a population is certainly less than 0.1%. Hundreds, probably thousands of genetic variants are involved in the variation in intelligence that you see in a certain population. So what's the point in changing one or a few to have any chance of improving intelligence? You need to change hundreds, and that's not going to happen. We're not going to be able to change hundreds in, uh, by embryo editing. And so if you like, the, the complexity of the genome is its own best defense against people who would like to try and change it. It's just very, very complex. But what about the worldviews that undergird and influence our ethical toolbox in a way that might change the discussion about embryo editing? Well, it's very likely just to take again a materialistic worldview. This would probably highlight the importance of utilitarian ethics in this context that we're talking about here. Is the procedure safe? Do the benefits justify the costs? And it's unlikely within this worldview that will, there will be great concern for embryo wastage during the in vitro fertilization and gene manipulation procedures involved. But what about, just to take a contrast then to the materialistic worldview, what about a theological worldview? I realize that my audience today are those engaged in Islamic theology and there will certainly be important beliefs within the Islamic worldview that will influence the ethical decisions in this context. But I'm no expert on Islamic theology, so instead I will give you a reflection from my own Judeo-Christian worldview, just to give an illustration of how this worldview influence might work. Here there is the idea of every single human being being made in the image of God, and that might be a particular re relevance, since that means that every human is of value and loved by God, irrespective of their particular genetic endowment. But of course that raises the question, what do we really mean by this little phrase, image of God in this theological tradition? Well, we find first use the phrase in the Bible in the, in the Tavrat, right at the beginning of Genesis chapter one, where we read then God said, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created humankind, Adam, human meaning humankind here, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So that, of course, leads us to the next question. Well, how would the first readers of this text in the ancient Near East have understood the idea of humankind being made in God's image? 
I suppose an important clue comes from the many contemporary texts of that time that talk about the king as being in the divine image of one of the many polytheistic gods that were revered by the nations surrounding ancient Israel. And so most likely the early readers of Genesis would have first thought of kingship as they encountered this idea of humankind made in the image of God. So here's a totally new idea about the value and status of humankind. Humankind created with dignity and worth, called to play a delegated kingly role, male and female alike, in caring for the created order. And so the kingly and priestly roles previously allocated to just a privileged few by this pantheon of polytheistic gods were now being delegated instead by the one created God to the whole of humanity. And so it was now humankind as a whole who were to play the kingly role, not just the elite. So we see Genesis chapter one has quite a revolutionary idea embedded within it, if you place it within its historical context. And so therefore every single human being is of value in the sight of God and is loved by God. So humankind's value lies not just in some list of intrinsic qualities, but in God's delegation to humankind of a status that we certainly do not deserve. And that status is bestowed upon the whole of humankind as a community. And those whose genetic endowment entails that they suffer some handicap in life, be it physical or mental or both, are as much sharers of the image of God as anyone else. And where the individual is unable to express or fully practice their image of God's status, then human solidarity insists that we care for and protect those less fortunate than ourselves. If you like, the, the care receiver is as much reflecting their status as being made in the image of God as the caregiver. So how is that worldview relevant to the question of embryo editing? Well, it might raise questions about whether to use either pre-implantation diagnosis or embryo editing to prevent the birth of a child having a genetic condition that is actually quite trivial or could be easily treated, or perhaps just gives a 50% lifetime risk of having a particular disease. And one of the dangers of introducing these wonderful new technologies, they might be introduced to really uh, cure terrible diseases that cause death in very early childhood, but then they become, they can become trivialized to choose things that are really not terribly important. And all of us have at least a one in three lifetime risk of developing cancer. Maybe it's even higher than that now at, two, at one in two, a 50% chance during our lifetime. And I guess we wouldn't want to eliminate one third of the world's population just to prevent the risk of cancer in later life if we had the ability to do so, which of course we don't at the moment anyway. And within the Judeo-Christian worldview that I was just summarizing, there might also be concerns about the wastage of early human embryos and an emphasis on the importance of virtue ethics. For example, what kind of society are we creating if we aim to eliminate all kinds of genetic diversity that might be possibly negative or deleterious? The Judeo-Christian worldview might also support the utilitarian's consequentialist worry about the slippery slope, pointing out that because humankind are sinful, such a powerful technology is very likely to be used for evil purposes eventually. Well, I hope you can by now see that our ethical toolkit and the worldview in which it is embedded really does help in the ethical decision-making process, but it's not perfect. These are very complex issues. We cannot simply just automatically conclude the correct way to proceed using our ethical toolkit, but nevertheless, I think it can be of real help. Finally, can I just mention my own recent book, Are We Slaves to Our Genes, which came out a couple of years ago now, which addresses some of the religious and ethical questions arising from behavioral genetics in this case. And if you are interested in buying a copy, well, I can tell you the cheapest place to buy a discounted copy is from our own Faraday Institute online bookshop here in Cambridge, where we sell the book at nearly half price. Uh, but now our time is up and it's over to you for questions and discussion. So thank you very much.
for your interest and attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander, for this uh, amazing talk, this lecture, which I'm sure raises some questions. Again, uh, I see already one question by Nidal Gusum. One second for all the others, the audience, you can write it in the chat. So I will read it or you raise the hand. Please don't forget to mention your name and your institute. But now I give the, uh, the, the talk or the, the word to Nidal Kusum. Please, uh, if you want to uh, open your mic and you can directly address the question to Dr. Alexander. Uh, good evening. I I was actually just uploading. I was not raising my hand for a question, but this gives me a chance to say hello to my dear friend Dennis and uh, to thank you all for this opportunity. I enjoyed the lecture and I am uh, uh, listening carefully to the discussion. I have some ideas or thoughts on this, but uh, nothing major, so I'll pass on. Thank you. Good to talk to you, Nidal. Nice to speak to you. That was uh, my bad. Sorry for that. I thought that was uh, raising hand, uh, the hand. Um, anyone else? No? Uh, Professor Alexander, I, I would like to ask if, um, because you, we spoke about uh, Judeo-Christian uh, religion, and uh, you said uh, you don't have so much uh, insight into the Islamic theology, I wonder if outside of the Abrahamic uh, religions, especially in China, where um, this uh, doctor also worked with CRISPR Cas method, um, how is it? Uh, how would you say is it different to a monotheistic religion in comparison to polytheistic religions? Can you maybe see a difference in the understanding of theology and the understanding of God in this comparison of polytheistic and monotheistic? Yes, I think there is. there are some important differences and thank you for raising that question. Uh, and clearly that's a huge topic in its own right. And again, I, I don't claim any expertise in the area of, of Hindu and Buddhist um, thinking, uh, for example, and I suppose if we're looking at the scientific community around the world, um, there's been a huge growth of science in India, especially over the past 10, 20 years um, or 30 years longer, and the institutes of science in India are really very advanced and contributing uh, some wonderful research results to the research literature. So. In terms of Hindu thinking on it, I think clearly these are monistic religions and therefore all reality is one. And I think my impression, and this is an impression, maybe those uh, who've got greater expertise in Hindu uh, religion and philosophy would like to comment, but my impression is it's actually quite utilitarian. In other words, it would sort of go in the utilitarian direction, um, consequentialist direction of the ethics um, because there is that concern for the impact of the science upon other people, upon their neighbor, upon health, upon medicine, and so forth. Um, so I think in many ways, um, it's certainly from the science institutes that I know in India, it would go more in that direction. And I guess it's also interesting because although obviously you have a distinctive um, background in Hindu religion and Hindu philosophy. Many of the scientists, uh, for example, in the top Indian institutes of science, most of them, the great majority actually, have done their PhD or their postdoc, they've done research in America or in Austria or England or somewhere in Europe, and they've also absorbed quite a lot of Western thinking as well, particularly in the area of ethics. And so they've carried with them um, that they do actually probably um, have some training and some manuals they have to look at concerning the ethical implications of their research. And so sometimes what you find in those Indian institutes of science is a, a kind of mixture. You find a mingling really of, of kind of some roots there in Hindu philosophy, but they're also very mixed up, if you like, with traditional Western philosophy 
And traditional Western philosophy and Western ethics, as we've been thinking, has been so influenced by the Judeo-Christian worldview and theology over the years. So I think it's hard to, to take very specific, you know, isolated. It, it's hard to, to get a view which is totally isolated, simply because we live in a global village, you know, where this communication is so intensive around the world, and that's especially true in science. Uh, and so, as it were, to get an isolated Hindu ethical position in relation to science, uh, I don't know if one can do that anymore. Perhaps a hundred years ago you could do that, but now it's got more difficult. So that's my reflection on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we got one uh, hand raised by Farisa Bishaiwa, so I will uh, give the floor right to you, Farisa. Please, you turn on your mic. Thank you a lot, Michiel. Um, first of all, thank you for the great lecture. Um, my name is Farisa Bishaiwa, and I'm um, at the moment doing my master's in Islamic religious pedagogy. And um, I would have two questions. Um, the first one is, uh, what do you think about um, preventing conflict with giving religion and science its own separate spaces, which seems, which seems to me personally the leading opinion kind at the moment? And my second question would be, um, have you experienced limits or like walls regarding the interaction between faith and science? Thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. Yes, I'm, the reason I'm going back in the slides here, simply go to go back to our discussion at the beginning of the lecture on uh, how we see science in relationship to other forms of human knowledge. So you are right that certainly in many parts of the world, there is still a view that somehow science and religion are in conflict. And certainly in my country and in the United States, this has been promoted by particularly recently the new atheists who would like to claim that, you know, if you believe in evolution, for example, which I certainly do believe in evolution, uh, that somehow brings you automatically um, into a position of conflict with religion and so forth. So I think now that is beginning to change. It's difficult to generalize, but I think there's been so much uh, education in that, on that particular point that I think mostly that in the general public in England anyway, I think that view is less popular than it was 10 years ago, but maybe I'm just an optimist there. But as we can see from this model, there are many ways of knowing. There are many ways of knowing. There are scientific ways of knowing, there are ethical ways of knowing, aesthetic ways of knowing, personal ways of knowing, religious ways of knowing. And they all have their own particular way of justifying their beliefs of uh, what kind of evidence do they produce for those beliefs and so forth. As we were saying, this is how our universities are structured in these different disciplines. And each discipline would justify its own particular beliefs in a certain way. And so um, if you go to the Faculty of Law here or the Faculty of History in Cambridge, you know, the way they would produce evidence for their beliefs is, um, is great and it's well justified, it's very solid, it's very good. That's why we have good law, but it's different from the way that scientists would uh, justify their beliefs that they publish in their papers. So there really is no need for conflict between these different ways of understanding necessarily. These different ways of knowing have no necessary conflict involved. Now, of course, conflicts do happen. Now, why do they happen? Well, they can happen, I think, from the science side, they can happen when science claims too much for scientific knowledge. And so, and we've seen that with the new atheists like Richard Dawkins in my own country, like the late Christopher Hitchens over there in the United States and so on. And so their claims become exaggerated. They want to claim that science has all the answers to all the major problems or questions that we might ask. This is a philosophy known as scientism. But scientism is not the same as science. Scientism is a philosophy that is parasitic upon science, if you like. And so, but if they claim that, obviously, that will bring them into conflict with religion. But that is the philosophy of scientism that's in conflict. It's not science itself. 
But of course, from the religious side, we've also seen ways in which religion can generate conflict, I suppose most famously uh, by the kind of young earth creationism that is popular, still popular in the United States of America, especially. Ironically, given that the USA still leads the world in science, it's a big irony that creationism is still has some popularity uh, in certain religious communities in the United States. Now, clearly, if you claim that in the name of religion, <coughs> excuse me, if you claim that the world is only 4,000 years old or 10,000 years old, that will bring you into direct conflict with, <coughs> with science. So you do get these genuine conflicts, there are genuine conflicts <coughs> that go on, but I think on the whole, there is really no need for conflict, especially when we think about the complementary nature of relationship between science and, and faith. Now to come to your second question, thank you for the two questions. To your second question, I think was whether I personally had experienced uh, conflict in science and faith. I certainly haven't experienced any conflict within the scientific community. When I do my science, um, actually the scientific community generally is very, it's a very tolerant community. If you are religious, if you have religious faith as I do, then people are quite happy about that. There's no problem about that. It's up to you. you know, so it, it's, it's a very tolerant community, I would say, on average around the world, not in every place, but most of the time it's tolerant. And so I've never experienced any conflict in the scientific community itself. And people like Richard Dawkins, I was an atheist in my own country, are very, they're very rare species, actually. There aren't many people around like that in the scientific community. I'm afraid he gives the wrong impression about what the scientific community is like. It's really not as Richard Dawkins would like to present it. Where I found conflict, I think more is simply going out into uh, some churches, for example, here in England or visiting uh, places in the United States, uh, visiting churches there where there might be some creationist beliefs. That has certainly been an experience of conflict. I've sometimes experienced conflict in the public domain, uh, in the public domain in these areas of ethics, where if one is involved, for example, in, well, if you're trying to do research on early embryos, I've never done research in that area, but people who do that might come into conflict with uh, certain uh, theological positions or religious positions that would be suspicious or be worried about that kind of research. So I think there are conflicts which go on in that kind of area as science is going very, very fast at the moment. It's very difficult for the general public to keep up with what's going on in science right now. And I think that itself, the speed of the advance of science can lead to some conflicts sometimes. But thank you for those questions. Thank you for mm -hmm. the answers. Um... So I got another question from Shannon. Um, the question would be, can philosophically developed ethics replace belief? So what he means is, so why should we still expect something for our behavior from religion when we have developed ethics? What else does religion add to what we already have in ethics? So probably, if also, as you mentioned, the atheistic uh, uh, group is uh, increasing and uh, creates conflict with uh, religious groups. So um, why believe anyway? Or can we, do we need religious belief in the future? What's your opinion about it? Um, to have it on a ratio, only to have ratio in an utilitarian uh, sense, does it make sense for you know what you know what I mean? Yes, what, yes, please. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you for that. Well, clearly, I think I mean let's just take the scientific community. If you're talking about the scientific community, it's a real mixture of everybody. If I think of my research group that I used to have here in in Cambridge, I'm I'm now retired from active research. But my laboratory had, I suppose, about 15 people in it most of the time. 
And most of the time, I did not know what their worldviews might be. Occasionally, it might come out in coffee conversations. Um, some believed in God, some were atheists, some were agnostics, some were Muslims, some were Christians, some were Hindus. I, I mean, we have everybody <laughs> in the scientific community. And I think that's actually rather wonderful. It's a rather wonderful aspect of the scientific community that we can all unite about certain scientific questions, problems we want to solve. We're using the same methods, the same techniques, the same sorts of approaches everywhere in the world. And so that's wonderful. And, and so on purely pragmatic grounds, practical grounds, then we, we can agree, of course, we can agree about general uh, ethical principles. In the research institute I used to work at here in Cambridge, it's called the Babraham Institute, just a few kilometers where I'm speaking at the moment. And there we have our ethics committee. Uh, I served on the ethics committee for some time. And on the ethics committee, uh, we had different scientists. We had, uh, we had a priest from the Church of England that we brought in. We had uh, one or two other people from the general public. And we would sit around the table. And of course, we all had different worldviews, okay? Uh, some of them very different. But, you know, from a practical point of view, we all had the same handbook, if you like, the same handbook of ethics. We all agreed on certain uh, principles, certain utilitarian principles, and certain ways of doing things, certain ways, especially of how should we treat animals. And that's, of course, is a big question in the biomedical research field, the care of animals, the use of animals in research, the limits on that, how you should do it. That is a huge topic and one which spent, I've spent many hours on in ethical discussions. So a lot of that is based on very pragmatic, practical arguments. And those arguments are based on the four ethical principles actually that we were talking about today. But if you go back, of course, to see the history of those principles, then some of them, not all of them, but some of them have deep theological roots, virtue ethics, and especially deontological ethics, especially, and so on. So there's a lot of theological history in how those ethical principles have come about. Now, of course, if you now go on to the question, which I think was the larger question being given there, well, why do we need, um, why do we need a religious explanations at all you know what extra do they give us okay and that obviously uh, i would i could give you a one hour lecture on that i'm afraid it would take a long time to really uh you know to look at that question in more detail but if you look down the bottom of your screen of course what we have when we look at this amazing science and we look at these amazing ethics uh, amazing beauty of the creation uh, amazing personal experiences and so on then for most people i think who are intellectually aware and intellectually um, active, this raises some big questions, you know, says the question we have at the bottom of the screen there was the one that Stephen, the late Stephen Hawking here in Cambridge would like to ask, what breathes fire into the equations? In other words, why do we have a Schrodinger's equation that describes the properties of matter in mathematics that you can write down? And when you look at the little squiggles, you know, these mathematical squiggles, on the wall that somehow describes the actual properties of matter. That's a very remarkable fact, okay? And then we all, I suppose, when we're looking at the world around us, it, it is a bit like a drama, isn't it? There's a great drama that's going on, full of morality, full of good and bad, and things that people are doing. Uh, most people think there is a purpose in life of some kind. And so that raises this question of, at the metaphysical level, at the level that goes beyond science, what might explain this existence in the best possible way? And of course, that raises the question of, is there a God who has intentions and purposes in bringing about this particular existence and so on? So I think science itself actually very often pushes us, pushes me and pushes other people into asking these kinds of questions. Once you have this kind of science, this kind of existence, then most people sometime during their life are going to ask the question, well, why do we have this kind of existence? What does it all mean? And I could go on, I won't go on any longer on that point, 
but let me just mention a book which you might be interested in actually. I've just been co-editing a book uh, with a professor of science and religion in Oxford, who's just retired from his chair actually, um, Alistair McGrath. And we're co-editing, we have been co-editing a book together. And the title of this book is Coming to Faith Through Dawkins. And the reason for that is that what we discovered, we both discovered as we were giving lectures on science, religion in different parts of the world. And here in Cambridge, we have many courses on science and religion. And Nidal Gesum there has spoken on our summer course that we have here in Cambridge um, several times, actually. And as you ta start talking with people, you know, that you don't necessarily ask them about their religious beliefs, but they may want to tell you. And we kept discovering people who said, well, I used to be an atheist until I started reading Richard Dawkins. And then as I read Richard Dawkins and his books about atheism, I just realized the arguments are really weak. Okay? And it really got me thinking about the arguments that he is criticizing. And it really led them into an intellectual pursuit of thinking about those big questions of life. And to some degree, some of them uh, were more influenced by the late Christopher Hitchens over in the United States, um, one of our British people who we exported to the USA and now sadly no longer with us. And so the, this book is actually 12 uh, essays or 12 chapters by 12 different authors from five different countries, from Australia, from South Africa, from Egypt, from United States and from England. Um, and they're just simply people telling their account of how they came to faith as a result of Richard Dawkins and his writings. And I find that quite interesting because it does relate to the question you were asking. <laughs> well, once you start thinking, thinking is dangerous. You know, <laughs> Thinking is quite dangerous. And I notice here in Cambridge, we have a lot of people who come up to Cambridge as undergraduate students. They come as atheists, but they leave as, as believers of some kind. And that I find quite interesting because they're taught how to think. When you start thinking, then you start asking those questions that we see at the bottom of the screen here. <laughs> and I think that can lead uh, to religious faith. So look out for the book. It'll be coming out next year, Coming to Faith Through Dawkins. The publisher is called Kregel, K-R-E-G-E-L, Kregel, Kregel Publications. It's an American publication. We don't have the exact uh, publication date yet, but it'll be next year. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we uh, are 10 minutes over the time we expected, but I think that's okay. We listened carefully and it was a highly interesting and fascinating talk. For sure, this audience uh, will not stop thinking. And uh, I also believe the topic will go on in the future. It will not stop uh, science moves on and also the questions um, to it uh, from the perspective of religious persons groups. So thank you again, Dr. Alexander. Um, thank you also the audience um, for participating, for listening to this great lecture. Um, one uh, program uh, tip for next time on the 22nd of November, um, the next lecture is uh, Islam and Science by Professor Dr. Nidal Gusum. We are looking forward to see you there, to meet you there. Maybe also Dr. Professor Alexander is uh, joining us. Um, if not, it's good too. It was great to, ha to have you here. Thanks again and all the best for everybody. Have a good evening, have a good night. See you next time at this. And thank you very much for your good questions, which I much enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. To all the others again and uh, to channel uh, maybe you can stop the uh like the, the recording now yeah thank you very much for this exciting talk uh, and your value time i hope that we met face to face have a nice evening greetings to england thank you thank you very much yes on my side as well channel anything else we want to say i would wait uh, yeah, you can go. I'm just here for one yes. minute. <laughs> no, perfect. Um, Dr. Alexander, thanks again from my side. And we enjoyed a lot. 
I am the last person who will uh, let I mean leave okay. the session. Yeah. Hey, was my internet was the internet uh, um, was the internet good for me? Yeah. 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 Yeah.